Good morning. Um, this is the webinar number 16. And we will talk about interfaces uh, in object This is the webinar number 16. Um, about interfaces in object oriented programming and why, in my opinion, they have to be small, functionality poor, and what would be the problem if they would be big instead, which is a quite typical, which is a quite typical problem in 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 Java, for example, and in very very typical uh, and common mistake which I observe in, in the interfaces I work with and the classes I work with. So I prepared a number of slides which I would like to share. So let me find this feature so I can share them with you um, to demonstrate what is the problem. So interfaces. Uh, just a few, just a little introduction first about what interface is and what it's used for in object-oriented programming. So let's say we have the, some media on the left. I hope you see my, my, my screen now. So we have some media which is expecting some book to be, uh, to be given to it in order to show it somewhere. Let's say it's a screen or a printer or some, some media which we call the method show and we give the parameter which is SQL book. So there is some book which is stored in, the, uh, in some database, which is probably somewhere here. And uh, this, this book is given to the media and then media will show it to, the, to somewhere, for example, the screen. And then we have three methods in the book, which is uh, the different ways, the different formats in which the book can be, can be rendered. So we can ask the book to give us the content in the PDF format or an HTML format or a text format. So there are three different formats which uh, which the book can present itself to the media. So media is, can comfortably call any of them and then show that that thing on the on the screen, for example, on the printer. That looks okay as long as we are, but, but the problem here, it, it works, but the problem here is that the media and the SQL book, these two classes, uh, they are coupled to each other quite mm, strongly and we cannot break this dependency easily. So we cannot, uh, we cannot give something else to the media. We cannot give the, another book which would have the same properties, the same behavior, but would actually be the book stored not in the SQL storage, not in the database, but for example in NoSQL, you know, database, or maybe in a file, or maybe uh, in memory. So this media is strongly coupled with uh, with a SQL with a SQL book, which which means which makes this media also kind of a SQL media. And and that that dependency is not really is not really what we want to have in when we write in code because it will make us more difficult to uh, to implement, uh, how would say to uh, to separate concerns in our code because the media is the media and the book is the book. We don't want them to know that much about each other. We don't want the media to be that much attached to the SQL book specifically. We want media to know just enough to to render the book. So all media needs to know is that the the cloud that the object given here actually can show the content in three different formats but it doesn't need to know that it's exactly the sql book and that's why the interface was introduced in java it's interface in c plus plus there are no interfaces but just abstract classes and in different languages there are different uh, uh mechanism to do that but in java it's interface and i find them quite convenient so let's let's look at this so now we introduce an interface which is called book and the interface has three methods uh, this sign means that this is an interface. Mm, and now we are saying that the media is actually expecting just a book, not specifically a SQL book, but just a book, just any class which has these three methods. Either it's going to be SQL book or something else, it doesn't really matter for us. So what we're expecting here, the media class is expecting the one parameter of, of the interface book. It's not a class anymore, it's interface. And this interface, it looks like a class, I mean, uh, on the syntax level, it looks similar to the class, but uh, it's not exactly 
of the class. It doesn't implement any of these methods. So all of these methods are just like just abstract definition of what what will be implemented somewhere later. So the media doesn't know who is actually implementing that that method. Maybe the SQL book or maybe somebody else. So we are able to introduce another implementation of this book, and we may have many many implementations of that book, as long as all of them implement the interface. Uh, interface uh, book. So media is expecting the, an instance of an interface book, not a class, not of a class, but of an interface. That's quite convenient, and probably everybody knows how it works. This is just this is just how it should be. So this is I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say that that's the the right way because I assume you all understand that this is the right way. So we all we always have to in in 99% of cases of situations we have to define when we declare our methods like that we always have to make sure that this is an interface not a class that's very important and this is like i assume that all of you understand that so we should not if we see if you define your method and you you understand that there is a class standing here it means that you're coupled too much with that class so you couple your method and you couple your media class with that class too much so that design, I'm, I'm jumping two slides back. So this design is wrong because this is a class. So as soon as you, every time you see a method, when you, you declare a method and you see that the parameter is a class, there's something goes wrong. You need to refactor and you need to introduce an interface. So it's not an optional, this is the mandatory. It has to be everywhere. And like I'm saying, in 99% of cases. Unfortunately, Java is not like that. Some there are some primitive things in Java which are classes. For example, like file, string, integer, whatever, and they are classes. So you sometimes will have to declare here something like I don't know, uh, like this. So this is a class, yes. But that's just the unfortunate situation with Java that this is a class. In an ideal world. When you define your classes, there have to be always interfaces, not like that, not classes, but like this, interfaces. So this one has to be an interface. So I assume this is just clear. But now let's go further. Now getting to the problem I wanted to discuss. So in this, in this design, it looks okay for now, but let's see what's going to happen. Let, let's, let's look into these three methods and see what's going on. So we're asking this book to give us the content in three different formats. But, but it's obviously clear for us that, that this class will probably implement just one method, which will actually retrieve the content from some database. And these two methods, PDF and HTML, will just convert the, the content in LaTeX to PDF or to HTML. So this is not going to be uh, this is the, the actual the actual functionality which actually belongs to SQL book will only be here because these two methods PDF and HTML they will just implement the conversion of of one format to another that's clear right so it's not gonna uh, we're not gonna store the book in three different formats well maybe that will could be the case in some situations but let's assume that we're just storing. Uh, in one format, and then these two formats would generate on fly. The same will happen here. The same situation. So let's say that this the, this one is actually storing the uh, the content in let's say XML storage in some XML file, and then it converts that stuff to these two formats. So what's going to happen on the code level is this. So we will have a huge duplication of functionality. So in the SQL book class, we will have the method, this one, which actually loads something from SQL and returns the content. And then these two methods, they will get this content, convert to PDF and return. This one will get HTML, will get the same content, convert to, to HTML and return. In this case, in the XML book, it's going to be again the different the difference will be here. So here we're going to load it from XML storage somehow. And then in this method, we're going to convert it to PDF. In this method, we're going to convert it to HTML. So it's, it's clear that there's going to be duplication of functionality. And the red color, I marked the, the piece of code, which will be exactly the same in both classes. So every time I want to implement, I want to implement my interface book, I will have to re-implement these two functions, these two methods. 
So if I write another class, which will be called not a SQL, not XML book, but let's say no SQL book, or book in a file, or I don't know, book in an input stream, whatever. And every time I will have to implement three methods, all of them, while two of them will be exactly the same as from all other, inter all, all other implementations of this class, of this interface book. So I'm jumping one slide back. So in this case, I want to show that, that when the functionality, so let, let's think about why the functionality in the, in the interface book was, why we have three methods here. Mostly because we want to make the job of the media class easier so that the media class can decide which format is required and then can just uh, get the, the, the desired format right from the book. So we, are made, we made the interface book uh, too powerful and too functionality rich, I would call that, uh, in order to satisfy the customer, in order to satisfy the user. So the user is here, the user is the media class. And that means that, uh, that we made that, uh, we, we made the, the interface too big in order to make our customer happy. And that's the mistake, I think. Because by, by doing that, we are, uh, well, basically, we are first of all violating this idea of the single responsibility principle. So our interface is responsible for too many things. It's responsible for uh, getting the content of uh, of the book from somewhere from the storage, and also responsible for converting that content uh, to different formats. So that's basically the key problem. So we we put too much functionality into one interface in order to make our customers happy. And that's wrong. And that exactly the same problem actually will happen if we don't have interfaces at all. Again, let me jump back a few slides and look at this example. So let's say we don't have any interfaces. In this case, it's still a wrong design because the class SQL book, it's not just retrieving the, the, the book content from the SQL storage, which, which, which this method is doing, but also converting the content to different formats. So our class is functionality rich which is wrong so making classes which are doing uh many things to to make their customers happy is the wrong strategy instead and let me show you why instead these classes and interfaces but mostly interfaces because like i said i assume you you're not using just classes you're always doing that that way so you're always having interfaces so that's why i'm saying that interfaces have to be functionality poor which means that they should look like this. This is my next slide. So we still have the media here. Uh, still the method is called show book. And we still have the interface book. But now our interface has just one method. Just the method which is supposed to retrieve the content from the storage and return it the way it is. So now we have two classes which implement this interface. The first one is SQL book. Another one is XML book. And they actually implement the actual retrieval functionality. So this one goes to the database, this one goes to some XML file, whatever, and they just return the content and, and giving this book, you know, letting everybody get the content from the book. And then we introduce the new class, which I'm calling smart class, so called. So, -called. so this class is called book.smart. In Java, it, that would be an embedded class. In other languages, that could be something else. You can say, I don't know, you can. In, Ruby for uh, Ruby, there are also embedded classes, but uh, in in any other language, you can say like smart book, or even in Java, you can if you have many smart classes, like different different classes, then you can call this one is I don't know, yeah, this is going to be smart book. Another one could be uh, book that does something, and then so some extra classes which wrap, which which not actually wrap, but they encapsulate the instance of a book here. This is the property. That's an attribute. So we encapsulate the book here, and then we implement the functionality of, of conversion. So we convert to PDF and we convert to HTML. So now when the media wants to, to get uh, the PDF content of the book, it can get it directly from the book. It has to get the book and then enca uh, encapsulate that book into the smart book or book.smart. Actually, in Java, I would recommend to use book.smart. And then call the method PDF. So that will work 
on a Java level that work like that. So we have this class SQL book and we have class XML book. They are quite small. They only implement one method each. So they are small. They are functionality poor, so-called. So we do only one thing. They just load, they just load uh, in this case, from SQL in return. Then it loads from uh, XML in return. And then we have a new class, which is called book.smart, which encapsulates here, it encapsulates the book. And then it implements the, now it's not red anymore. And it implements uh, two methods. The first one is the actual conversion to PDF. Another one is conversion to HTML. So now, in order to use that, the media, the code in the media would look like this. New book.smart, the actual book.pdf. So in order for me to get the PDF content, I'm doing like that. So I cannot, when before, before all these changes, I was able to do, to do this way, to go that way. Let me show you. It was like that, book.pdf. That was what I was doing before, because my book was powerful enough to give me everything I want. It was powerful enough to give me uh, the content in Lydia, to give me the content in PDF, all kinds of content. Now, the book is quite simple. The, the book is quite functionality poor, so it, it can give me everything I'm looking for. But when I need something on top of the functionality, which is provided by the book, I just decorate it, not decorate, but I, I, I um, encapsulate it into the smart class, which actually has the functionality I'm looking for. So for those who are familiar with uh, utility classes that may look like 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 a utility class in Java, because with the, with, in case of utility class and, uh, and the static methods, that may look like this. For example, uh, PDF, and then we have book utils, let's call, and then convert to PDF. That would be that would be the approach which is called uh, utility classes, or the, the, that, and that that's very wrong because. Uh, we, we discussed many times why static methods are wrong. But the idea is that we move the function, the, the idea is similar. So we move the functionality of or some extra functionality, which can be shared among many books, among many different implementations of the book. And we put this functionality into some utility, uh, utility piece, utility place. But we're not doing it through utility classes or static methods. Instead, we introduce these smart classes, which are uh, which, uh, which technically, uh, on, on the code level, they look very similar to, to utility classes, but they are real objects. So this one is a real object. And if we can go even further, we can also make sure that this smart class, this one, actually implements the book. That will also help us, in some cases, to uh, sometimes to forget that this this book is this smart book is actually smart book, and we can say that something like that. Let's say book A. That let's say this is original book. This is original book, and this is the smart book. And then we work with that smart book like we can do it like this, but also we can do we can call the original method. So if after that assignment, something will, like some code goes here, and then later nobody needs to know that this smart is actually the book.smart, because it's also a book. So it, it behaves like a book, but it has an extra functionality on top of the book. And this extra functionality is added by, uh, through this, like we can call them utility methods or something like that. So it's like extra functionality, which we, which we add on top of the object. So that's basically what I wanted to show you. Now I have a few examples for you to like to try to convince you even more. But before we go there, let's take a look at the at this diagram again, and let's go a little bit like one more time. So the idea is that uh, to make interfaces uh, as small as possible and move their functionality, potentially duplicated functionality, outside of them as much as possible. So 
let them make them like one, two, sometimes even one method is enough for the interface. So if you have more methods, then probably there is something could be wrong and, and, you, and in the class as well. So think about what could be moved out of the class and, and how can you make the, the class even smaller. Because the smaller you make the class, the easier it is for everybody else to implement it again, to re-implement it in different, in, with different multiple you know, implementation uh, classes and, and not duplicate the code. Because code duplication is probably the most, the biggest problem in, in software development, is code duplication. As soon as you duplicate the code, like in this example, as soon as you have two methods, three methods, which look exactly the same, it just, it's just the, 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 it's just an obvious, um, an obvious, what would you call it? Uh, you're basically begging for trouble. It's an obvious case of, future problems. So you will definitely have a problem if you duplicate code. And if your interface is too big, and if it has too many methods, there is no way to avoid duplications. It will be very difficult to avoid that. We can probably, in this case, to avoid duplication somehow, we can, we can move, the, uh, we can move the, um, the functionality of converting from one format to another to some other class and put it some here, somewhere here. But it's still, we're gonna, we're gonna still have some functionality which will be duplicated in some places. So it would be way better if you just don't, don't make these classes think about that but make your interfaces smaller and functionality poor. Uh, and now um, I'll give you just a practical example. There is a library which is called, uh, which is called uh, JKB GitHub. And this is just an example to, if you wanna look at how this smart class is actually helping us. So you can look at this library, which was made about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, uh, I made it, and then many, many other programmers helped me after that. Uh, it's, it's a library which, uh, which is a client for, for GitHub RESTful API, it's a Java library. So this library, there, there are many, there are many RESTful objects in GitHub API. There are many entry points. It's, it's a huge API. And for each, for each entity, for each object there, for each of uh, these RESTful, let's call it an object, uh, we created uh, about 80, 83 or something, 80 interfaces. So there are interfaces like user, repository, issue, tick, uh, issue, pull request, command, commit, all that kind of stuff. So because GitHub is exposing all this information uh, to the outside world. And I created 80, about 80 interfaces for each of them. So we have interface for, like I said, issue, for example, interface for pull request. And then uh, all of this, all of this uh, restful guys, they are exposed to the public, to the world, by GitHub in the JSON format. So you make a request, you're asking, uh, give me the information about the user. And the GitHub returns you like a huge, not a huge, but a, quite a big document about the user, that everything inside, the, the name, the email, the avatar, um, the, the history of com commits, some, some uh, information about, a lot of information, like maybe sometimes there are like 100 parameters. So it's a huge JSON document. And, and that was a question. If I make the interface user such a big with 100, with 100 methods or 50 methods, then, and, and, and then, and then I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to have a number of, a number of implementations of each interface. So I have in the library, I have at least two, at least two classes for each interface. So one class implements the, the RESTful object, which actually makes the HTTP request and retrieves the information from about the user in the JSON format. And another class is for the is a fake class for testing purposes. So it doesn't go to the GitHub API, it just it just makes this JSON up and, and returns it to you, like with some fake information. It's quite useful for testing. So I made two classes for each interface. So there are 160 classes in the library. And then the question is, if my, if my user interface, for example, user or issue or pull request, will have 50 methods inside. And all of these methods are uh, quite simple. So basically we get the JSON from from GitHub, and then out of this JSON, 
we need these 50 methods to retrieve certain pieces out of it. So the actual functionality is in the method JSON, which goes to GitHub, retrieves something from there, and then just gives, OK, this is a JSON document. That's the core functionality. And then we need 50 methods which will, which will get pieces out of this JSON document and return back. So let's say, give me the avatar, or give me the name of the user. So what's going to be the name of the user? It will look quite similar to the example we discussed before. It will just call the method JSON, and then out of JSON it will retrieve the piece, one piece, which is name, one, one uh, attribute, and then return that back. And exactly the same will happen in all implementations of this interface. So that's why I made these 80 interfaces. All of them are small, and all of them just have the method JSON. And then we have smart classes for each of these interfaces. We, need to, we have smart classes. So we have, for example, class user, and we have user, and we have user.smart. So in this class, we have just methods, JSON. And here, we have like 50 methods. So and then I have implementation. I have a RESTful user, and I have fake user fake or it's called mock, mock user. There are two different classes. So this one implements just method JSON, and this one implements just method JSON. And then 50 plus methods, they go into the smart class. So we do not duplicate these 50 methods in these two classes. They only implement just the JSON, because in this case, it makes the actual RESTful call. And this one, no call, just fake data. It just returns you fake data. Then we can just decorate and say uh, new user smart new, for example, like that. In this case, and then I call name. Give me the name or avatar. Give me the of this user. In this case, it's going to go to the real GitHub and retrieve the real uh, JSON from there and give me the real avatar of the real user. Or I make it like this, and then it doesn't go anywhere and just just get the fake data and return them to me. So that's an example. That's what I wanted to demonstrate. Uh, that's how it works with the library. So check it out. Check the library. That's the URL. And that will be you know, quite obvious, I think, how it works. So you can look. There are many, many, like 80 interfaces, quite big library. And all of them are really small. Like Some of them have three methods, maybe sometimes four. But that's the maximum. But if you count the amount of methods in the entire library, it will be thousands. And all of these methods, they stay with the smart classes. And these classes never duplicate each other, because they just do one job, and then they, and they, and they, always, and they are separate from the, from, from the actual interfaces. So that's what I wanted to show. Um, there's one more thing. We have time. So I'll show you that Like usually questions are, um, which I, I published an article about that on the blog a few months ago, and there were a number of questions which I decided to answer today. Maybe it will be a little bit too complex diagram, but still, let's let's try. So the question is that: What if, in this example, everything looks looks good, everything I explained looks okay, as long as we assume that uh, that these classes actually are retrieving the content in this format, and here also in this format. And both of them uh, convert from LaTeX to PDF and to HTML. But what if this one stores the content in LaTeX, and this one wants to store it in HTML and convert to LaTeX? So what, means, what it means that, uh, that someone may say that we are making the book interface so big, that there are three methods, because we want to give freedom to our classes to return the content in the way they want. So some class will say, I want to store my content in LaTeX. Cool. Another one will say, no, PDF is better for me. So this one will get LaTeX convert to PDF. And this one will say, no, I store in PDF and I convert back to LaTeX or I convert back to HTML. And that's exactly the situation uh, where people were criticizing my article about input stream. So in Java, there's input stream class, which, uh, which has three methods. 
to read the data. One method reads one byte, another method reads uh, as many bytes as possible into an array, and then another then the method number three reads a portion of like a, a number of bytes and position and places them into a certain position in the array. So like three different ways of read of reading the data. And some people are saying that this is not wrong. This is just an extra flexibility for a potential uh, implementation of this input stream. Uh, because sometimes sometimes it's faster and more convenient and just, just faster for, for certain reasons. We just want to read one byte. And then we implement the other two methods uh, we, we just make them the way they use the, the original, the, the first one, the method which reads one byte. By. Another example, we implement the class the way that uh, there is a method which reads an array is the main one. And the other two are just reusing it. So that's a valid point. That's a valid concern. So we can say that, that yes, we, we are not just doing it because we are stupid, but because we want to give extra uh, opportunity for optimization for our classes. So we're making this intentionally in this way uh, because we we want our classes to uh, to be flexible enough to you know to implement them to implement themselves in the most effective way. I agree, but I think that it should be done differently anyway. So I built this diagram to to show how how I would do it if if that would be the necessity to do it like that. So if we don't know who will exactly uh, who will uh, implement which method, and we want to give this flexibility to everybody. So let's look at what's going on. Uh, we have still the medium, and we have the interface book, and now it's big. Yes, it has three classes, it's three methods. So we want to, we, 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 uh, we have it this way here because we don't want to, uh, we don't want to, to give media the ability to decide which format goes first. Because in this example, if I just jump a few slides back, here, when we moved out these two methods out of the class book, we just assumed that all books will be able to implement that method first. And that, that's how we are actually dictating all of them that they have to be, they have to store the content in the LaTeX format, which is like we just discussed, which is, could be a potentially not a good way for them. They may be against that. They may say, I want to store in PDF or in XML, whatever. But we made that decision, and this decision is kind of forced, and, and the media here will create the smart class and will encapsulate book inside, which assumes, the situation assumes that the book is in a LaTeX. And then we, we just convert to PDF and convert to HTML. So this design is fine as long as we are ready to dictate our decision and, and uh, enforce all classes to go that way. Sometimes we don't want that. Sometimes we may say that we want to give the flexibility to them. So let's jump to this slide and say, okay, now, all right, now the media doesn't know which format goes first. So the book, the book still has three methods. And the media here will just call whatever method is necessary, let's say just PDF, without the knowledge of how this PDF is, is generated. Maybe it's just coming originally from the book, or maybe it's generated by the, maybe it's just transferred from HTML, let's say. So we create three new interfaces. The first one, PDF book with the content method, HTML book with the content method, and LaTeX book with the content method. So now we have three interfaces. And then three different implementations of them. So this is one is SQL book, which stores the LaTeX, because the, the SQL book says, OK, I want to store uh, in LaTeX format in the database. The XML book says, you know, for me, it's better to store in HTML. So I store my book in, okay, let's call it file book, not to confuse. So I store in file. So I store in file and it's good for me to store in HTML. And this one, it says, I want to store in HD in RDF database or whatever, let's call it uh, MongoDB. I store in MongoDB, so this is MongoBook. And I like to store in RDF, in, uh, in PDF. So uh, all my books in my database in MongoDB, they, they stay in PDF format. In files, they stay in HTML. In SQL, in you know, MySQL, for example, they stay in, in LaTeX format. 
we have three three interfaces, three different implementations of how the books are managed. And now we need to give them ability to, now we need to somehow find a way to not to duplicate the functionality of jumping from LaTeX to HTML, from PDF to HTML, to, to, to exchange this format. So in this case, we create three smart classes. The first one is called from LaTeX. So this one encapsulates this one, LaTeX book goes in here. So let me, I didn't put this lines in there. So this one goes here. This one is encapsulated here. So we have the smart class which implements the book, which has three methods, and it encapsulates LaTeX. So we create an instance of this book, which is now a smart class, but at the same time it implements the book. So it gets it, it, it's a converter, basically. It's a converter which is a book. It encapsulates the book in LaTeX, and then obviously the method LaTeX in this case will just return what's encapsulated what's encapsulated. And if the PDF is called, it will convert from LaTeX to PDF. If HTML is called, it will be converted from LaTeX to HTML. In this case, from HTML. Uh, we encapsulate this one. And in this case, it's like that. So when the you probably follow. If not, you can you can look at it later and, and understand this diagram. Maybe it's too complex, but for me, it kind of looks okay. It looks understandable. So the point is that we are still we, there is still no duplication of code. We still have this this smart classes. So these three guys, I'm I'm still calling them smart classes because they are uh, they they provide the functionality which we are supposed to share between other objects, and they're not they are kind of supplementary objects. So they are just making our objects smarter. That's their main purpose, just to make our objects smarter. So now they do make this object smarter. So this object just knows how to get the content in, in LaTeX and how to return it. But it doesn't know how to jump to PDF or how to jump to, to HTML, how to convert itself. We create this smart converter or smart class, whatever, uh, the, the, not the converter, but smart class. So it's not the converter. It's not a utility function. It's not a utility method. It's a smart class which is smarter than this one. So this one is kind of stupid for us. It's just not stupid, but not functionality uh, rich enough. It just has one method. But this one has three methods. So it's richer. But it doesn't actually implement the, 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 the key thing of loading the, the content from anywhere. So the, the, how to load the content, these three classes know. This Mongo book, file book, and MySQL book. And these three guys, they know how to convert between different formats. And then this book is given to the media, and the media just works with any format it wants. So that's basically what I wanted to say. Now your questions, you can post them on, uh, on the YouTube, in the chat. And I will try to answer. I hope you. Uh, let me stop the screen sharing. Mm. Yeah. So that was it. That was my idea of the smart classes. I explained it in the book, in the Elegant Objects book. Uh, there's the whole uh, section for it. Uh, which suggests to to use that approach, and I'm like practicing that for about like a, two years, probably in a few libraries, and it so far it proves to be quite effective because I basically get rid of uh, code duplication, and I can share functionality between uh, different pieces of code without uh, making utility classes and without uh, making yeah, basically without making any utility classes and static methods, by just introducing these smart classes, which are convenient uh, utils, I would say, for the for that kind of programming. So one more thing, which uh, which also someone asked on the blog about that subject, was about the the performance 
So, but I think that this diagram explains the performance problem. So if the performance is an issue and you really want to, uh, the diagram, which I mean the, the, the last one, the big one, uh, the performance uh, is, can definitely be sometimes a problem like with the input stream uh, situation. And it is solvable by, by like I showed, some introduction of uh, just supplementary more interfaces, just break down the, the, the one interface into pieces. And in each interface, uh, implement their own like, small piece of functionality and then put them together into a bigger interface. But, but, but stay away from, from code duplication. That's the idea. There are some questions probably coming in the in the chat. Let's wait for them and uh, let me check the. There are some questions probably. Let me check the original article where I'm saying that input stream design is wrong. Even I'm, that there are there are probably some historical issues with this input stream design, but I'm just I would I using I'm using that example in the in the blog post just to demonstrate that that the design is not perfect probably there were some historical reasons for that design and i can uh, certainly understand that but but if you're designing something now for the future then then do don't do that so don't don't make your classes big enough so that all of your clients all your customers will be happy to to use all possible different methods. So the more methods you give to your customers in your original class and your original interface is just making your life more difficult and their life as well because because the class becomes less less combinable, less composable. So you cannot use it in in many different places. You just you just get it stuck into into one specific implementation. So we have some questions. Let me read them. Um, yeah, that's the question. Why do I put the smart class into inside the interface? So why make it like embedded class and not use the usual external class like book smart? Uh, uh, the question is, yeah, that, that's that's the question I've heard before. Uh, I think that it's kind of a, mm, I just want that class to be, that's that's probably the, the, the problem I'm, it's a workaround for the Java problem. So I want that class to be the smart class to be visible for, for the users of the interface. So that's why I'm, I'm trying to put it inside the, uh, the interface so that when you use the interface and your documentation and, and everywhere, my smart class will just pop up uh, sooner and you will just realize, ah, if I need extra functionality, this is my help. This is where I can get help. So there is no like good documentation mechanism in Java, as far as I know, which will suggest you that when using this interface, hey, there are some decorators for this interface. There is no such thing. In Java, in the IDE, for example, you get the you get the hint of what methods are in the interface or what the uh, what what parameters are in the method, but there is no hint of saying that this inter this variable, for example, book can be decorated by a b c d classes unfortunately if that would exist that would be yeah that would be easier i would just create like a number of decorators and then i ship you my five decorators five smart classes i ship them together with my one interface and when you start using the interface you will immediately uh, understand and somebody will suggest you that uh some i don't know id or some editor will suggest you that you need to you can use one of these five decorators Unfortunately, it's not happening. And also, there's one question I forgot to mention that uh, someone asked me on the blog, why using this uh, smart classes instead of default methods? Because now in Java 8 or in Java 7, I'm not sure, there are, there are uh, default methods which you can place into the interface. And when you ship the interface, they, the interface already has a number of methods which you can, if you want, uh, redefine. But if you don't redefine them, they just go together with, with the interface. They kind of work exactly the same, not exactly, but uh, very, very close to what I suggested, to this smart class. And that's true. That's true. But uh, the, the key difference is that these default methods, they are... Uh, they stay together with the interface. And you cannot make... Uh, you cannot make them, I mean, with a smart class, you can make many smart classes. You can make like five different smart classes, which will do different things. 
and they all will be separate from the interface. So the interface will be uh, uh, the, 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 the interface, I'm just reading the comments. So the interface will be, uh, will, will go together with this default methods together and, uh, and, and while it would, in case of a smart classes, we can make them like five, 15, 20 different, different things. And they all stay kind of aside from the interface. And the interface is small and the classes are outside of it. If you put all of this stuff into default methods, uh, that will be kind of uh, too much, I think. That will overload the, uh, that will, and yeah, that will be too much, first of all. And, and second, it will be difficult to, uh, to, ch um, to use different smart classes for different purposes. Because these smart classes, they also can be differently implemented. For example, one smart class does something, for example, converting from uh, HTML to PDF, like in our example, and then another smart, smart class also converting from HTML to PDF. Exactly the same conversion, but the conversion is done differently. So we have two different smart classes, one interface and two different smart classes. And this one converts using some converter A, and another one does the same job using the different converter. So we have two different smart classes and one interface. In case of a default method, we're gonna just encode this default method into the interface, and then where are we gonna put the second one? It's kind of difficult, so we will probably, yeah, it's gonna be different. So, so these default methods, I would say, not i would recommend not to use them i i never used it myself and i think this is kind of a not a good idea in general so it's better to stay with the like you know just simple plain interfaces and classes and not to mix this default default things into into the picture uh a few more questions um uh, in general i agree about uh, single responsibility principle to make, make interfaces simpler and focused but your smart implementation looks strange um, it looks, it may look strange uh, in the beginning, but try to practice it because for me, also in the beginning, it was kind of unusual because when I started to do that, I, I, I was just trying to find a way how to get rid of the duplication, which I'm having here and here, because the more interfaces you introduce, if you look at your code, if your code is completely uh, covered by interfaces and every, everywhere you use interfaces, you will very soon hit the problem of, uh, of code duplication because all your interfaces will be implemented by some classes. And as soon as you start implementing them twice or three times, you will see that you are duplicating something. And then you will just, just realize that you need that, that kind of you know, supplementary classes which, where you can put your extra functionality into. Um, uh, one more question. How can I bind book data to the markup template without the template not knowing what's in the book? How can I bind book data to markup template without the template not knowing what's in the book? Uh, I'm not sure I follow the question. Um, book data to... Well, if you have some markup template and, and that template, I don't know what template means, but probably it's some, let's say some HTML, you know, like uh, JSP or not JSP, but some, some HTML document with some placeholders where you want to put some, for example, the document, a uh, book title or something else, then uh, I would suggest in general, I don't think this templating idea is good in general. So I would suggest to, uh, instead of getting the data out of the book and injecting into the template, it's better to, to teach the book to print itself into the template, something like that. So don't extract the data from the book in order to fill the template. Instead, just give the data somehow, give the, the book somehow the opportunity, the possibility to print itself in the way the book thinks is appropriate. So into your template, for example. So this functionality of drawing the, uh, the team, the drawing, the content, and drawing some page in any format has to stay inside the book, not outside. So extracting the data from the book and just filling the template, it's kind of procedural and it will eventually turn your book into, into just a dumb holder of data. And you will lose the whole idea of, of, of encapsulation of, of OOP and everything. But that's the question we're probably going dis to discuss before and we'll discuss later on. Uh, um, one more question. 
what if you want to store the book as a file, uh, either in PDF or HTML? Uh, I assume you need PDF file book, HTML file book, and then an intermediate format or something like that, right? Yeah, I think that's right. That's 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 how it should be. Well, this is the, the, the obvious approach, but maybe it can be refactored more and we can just break it down into even smaller something interfaces. But yeah, if you want to store the book as a file in PDF or HTML, then you create two different classes. That's right. One of them will implement the, uh, the PDF book and another one implement HTML book, but the, in a different way. So that's right. Um, uh, uh, one more question. The last diagram, why it's so complex? Why don't we introduce concepts like book source, uh, which implement, is implemented by file book source, Mongo book source? Uh, I don't think in general that, that basically that's a question which, is, <laughs> which will turn our book into uh, a data transfer object. So we will have we will have some, this is in general, this idea of a source where you ask somebody to give you uh, the book and then this book contains something. So the book becomes a container of data, which we ask somebody, first of all, give us this container and it comes back to us. This is wrong. So we shouldn't use objects as containers. We shouldn't just, uh, we should always, you know, th this, is, this is the moment where we break the, uh, where we break the, the, the object, paradigm at all as soon as we ask somebody to give us some data in the form of an object where this this uh, data are encapsulated so this idea in, of the source is in general is wrong i think um, uh, one more book format implementation should has uh, one more question. Um, the media should use book format list as input. Yeah, this is, I, I, I understand what these questions are coming from, but they are like, they're like, you're coming from the procedural point of view. So you're trying to simplify this problem by, uh, by just turning, by the turning uh, this book from, from an object to, uh, to, to just data, which we transfer from one source to another. And in that case, we, we, we can do that, of course, in that example, but, uh, we can rewrite this whole thing in just one one procedure, and and just and say if that do this, if else do that, and then maybe even introduce a switch which will decide which direction to go. But then we'll jump back to the procedural programming. So we want to be we want to be object oriented, and we want to have uh, we want to always be sure that all our objects are self sufficient structures. So they are responsible for everything that belongs to them. So they're not just holding data from one piece to another, but they belong, they're responsible, they are responsible for, for everything that, that, that belongs to that particular problem. So if this book is called uh, Mongo book, then it means that, that, that that's, then you never gonna, you're never gonna, uh, that it means that this is the book which stays in MongoDB and if you want some properties of this book, you just you just ask it for, for the properties of the book. But you're never going to ask, give me the whole, uh, well, in our case, it's the whole content. But you're not going to transfer the, the content and plus the format and, and, then, and then say, okay, now we just move, we just create an object which goes, you know, which, which goes from one place to another and it contains uh, the binary data plus the tag which says in which format is the data. We, in this case, we completely ruin the whole object-oriented paradigm at all. We just get back to procedural programming to see, and that's okay. Yeah, it's a data structure which has a number of tags, which says this, this is the structure which contains some data, and this data is marked as PDF data. Now get it, pro process it, and, and it's your decision what to do with them. That's a completely different story. We're just way behind that. So we... <laughs> Builder, another question. Uh, it seems to me like the builder design pattern. Uh, builder design pattern. I'm not sure I understand what the builder design pattern is doing here, but uh, no, as far as I understand, builder is something else. Builder is when you uh, have an object and then you ask this object to. Uh, to change something 
to, builder is no i don't think builder has anything to do with that uh i i disagree check check what builder is doing so it's it's something else this is this is very close to utility classes what i'm just showing is it, it really it is close really close to utility classes but in an object-oriented way so it's just moving the functionality outside of a class outside of an object somewhere else and and making sure this functionality is shared can be shared between other objects but uh, to do it in an object-oriented way, not through static methods, not through utility classes. Um, one more question, let me read it. I think a difficult point to get is that we do, no, we do need to choose an inter intermediate format to build the rest of the formats from. And this is a bit like having the whole content. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's, that's why I created that diagram, the last one. So that's, that's the point. So if you can choose, uh, if you can choose the, the one format, if you can choose what, which method is the main one, like in the example with the GitHub API, the main method obviously is the JSON method. That's really easy to understand. That's really easy to make this choice because JSON is JSON. It just really does the work. It goes to the GitHub through HTTP, retrieves the content. Everything is good. But... Uh, in that case, it's clear. In the example which I've, which I've done in the diagram, it's not so clear. You cannot make in all cases the decision which format is going to be the main one. So some book may say, I like to store in PDF. Another book may say, I like the HTML. So you need, that's right. So you need, if you can make the decision, then if you can enforce that decision and say to all books that you're going to store in HTML and that's it, then you just remove other methods from the from the class from your object and then tell everybody all other objects that you have to store in html and we don't care what what you think just return your content in html if you can make the decision then this more complex solution comes into play but still you don't you don't ask them three of them to implement these three methods at the same time you still give them these smart classes which are converters which they can use so you give them converters which help them uh, which help you to stay away from code duplication. So you still keep them small. You still keep these classes small because they all, you still give them the opportunity to implement just one method, just one method, not three. You don't ask the Mongo book to implement the converter. The Mongo book should not know about converting from HTML to PDF. This is not the job of Mongo book. It's the job of somebody else. And this somebody else, what is this somebody else? Utility class? Definitely not. Utility method, no. Static method, no. What is it? A smart class. Well, it's called a smart class. So it's something which knows how to, you know, how to use the existing functionality and do something on top of that existing functionality. That's the point. So try it out. So some of some of the chats, the, there are some people in chat say that they don't agree, but do not fully agree. That's that, that, that's just a matter of just try it, try it, try it a little bit because. Yeah, and, and just keep in mind that interfaces must be small. This is the main message I'm trying to deliver. Interfaces must be small. And then as soon as you, as soon as you agree that your interfaces must be small, then you will try to find a solution. And one of the solutions is probably the smart classes. So you will move your functionality outside and implement this supplementary support classes. So that's it. Thank you very much for coming. We just spent a full hour. See you next month, the first uh, Wednesday of the month, 11 a.m. in the morning. Bye-bye.